before I begin, a quick announcement. Uh, this Saturday, it's our EC day, and um, that'll run from seven, in, oh, sorry, 10 in the morning to two in the afternoon. Again, uh, this Saturday is EC day from 10 to 2 p.m. All right. Should we begin? Let me um, welcome you again to our colloquium. Very interesting talk today. Um, it's by Professor Daniel Butler from ASU, our very own. And um, he's going to talk about gamma ray bursts, past, present, and future. A little bit about Professor Butler. Um, he went to Princeton University for his undergrad in, and then moved to MIT for his PhD. After completing his PhD in 2003, he went to the MIT Center for Space Research and spent uh, two years doing wonderful research there and then moved to UC Berkeley, first as a town fellow and then also held the Einstein Fellowship there where he did a lot of very interesting work um, which eventually led to some of this work that we're gonna hear about today. And then he moved to ASU and we're very lucky to have him from 2011 onwards where he's studying astrophysics transients such as gamma ray bursts in various different wavelengths starting from optical infrared x-rays gamma rays he's also involved in detection techniques um, such as a um, lot of data mining he's also leading a robotic telescope which is super exciting so maybe we'll hear about some of that stuff too so with that i give floor to Professor Butler to talk about gamma ray bursts. Cool, thank you, Sanj. Okay, so I was asked to talk about gamma ray bursts, and I have a very Dickensian title here. And I'm gonna stick to the past, present, and future sort of outline to give you a sense of where this field has been, where it is now, and where it's going. So, I'll go kind of far in the past. I'll try to hit on maybe two main science topics. And then I'll talk about what we're doing to get ready for the, the next fire hoses that are going to turn on in this field. I'll also give you some background. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Cool. Let's see if this works. Okay, the past. So let's start, oh, about, let's say 50 plus years ago with uh, the Velador satellites, the Vela satellites, so-called Watchman satellites. Here's, uh, here's JFK, Winter Works, or uh, Ghost of GRB's past. There he is looking at one of these satellites, and they were sent into space uh, moder to, to, to monitor, um, basically, adherence to nuclear test ban treatment. Kind of a wild idea, maybe, not something that was actually going to happen in the nuclear test space, the upper atmosphere, or the moon, or the bizarre place. But it was certainly a, a technology demonstration. And from our perspective, the really exciting thing about the Vela satellites is they were the first to detect the gamma ray burst. This is a picture of one. What you see here is flux and gamma rays as a function of time. There's a zero here, which represents the sky background in gamma rays. And you can see this impulse, impulsive uh, kind of flare, a little bit of a tail of emission. The whole thing lasts about eight seconds and is gone. Okay, but it's a, it's a bright signal. First one in 1967, you notice the paper is 1973. This stuff was all an ultra top secret. Took a long time for any of this to hit uh, the presses. And for quite a while afterward, there were far more ideas for what could produce such a thing than there were actually things to measure. Okay. So there was a long sort of time gap between gamma ray burst detections and all the papers that came out attributing them to things like uh, aliens, uh, mission in the upper atmosphere, mission in the solar system, uh, mission outside of our solar system, all sorts of different physical contexts. Now, let me shift up a little bit and let's imagine what the sky looks like if you could see gamma rays. Put this in context. So this, that previous satellite had to go to space to see gamma rays. Gamma rays don't penetrate our atmosphere. 
But if you could get above our atmosphere, this is a picture of the whole sky and galactic coordinates. So that's the plane of our galaxy right here. And this is a, an integration of a few years, of the Fermi Space Telescope. So if you could actually look and see gamma rays, this is what the sky would look like. You'd see bright emission from the plane of our galaxy. It's due to exotic objects in our galaxy, like, uh, uh, you know, black holes and um, supernova remnants, all sorts of fun stuff. If you look outside of our galaxy up here, these are essentially black holes in other galaxies. Right? So if you see in gamma rays in the galaxy, there's these pockets here of fun stuff. And outside the galaxy, you get supermassive black holes in the center of other galaxies. Right? The sky itself is pretty, pretty quiet for the most part in gamma rays. It's basically tied up in these kinds of sources. Right? So this is, a, this is like a three-year integration. Now let's think about the dynamic gamma ray sky. This is from a gamma ray burst satellite an experiment called BATSI on that satellite. So this is the same sky view I showed you on the previous slide. There's the galaxy. There's some sources outside of the galaxy. And there's a gamma ray burst happening. So it's, at, uh, it's not coming from our galaxy in this example. And it's got a sort of similar time profile to the one I showed you previously. Where you can see I haven't subtracted the zero this time. There's maybe something like 5,000 counts in, in the background sky all the sky and gamma rays, then you get this impulsive uh, increase, almost a factor of 10, maybe a second, and the whole thing maybe lasts, maybe. Okay, so if you had gamma ray eyes and you looked at the sky, you would see these kind of explosions that are basically as bright as the entire sky every day. They're about that common. They're not unusual in that sense, but of course, they're not things we see because the light is around. That's a gamma ray burst. Okay, now a little history. So the way we do this game now, we have satellites in space, right? We have gamma ray detectors. Some, in some cases, they can slew to a position and observe in other task bands. They radio their position to the ground. And then we do follow-up using ground-based telescopes. The optical, radio, infrared telescopes all around the world. Keep in mind, one of these explosions happens in the last maybe 10 seconds, and then the position's immediately sent to the ground, so within maybe 10 seconds, within maybe a minute, we're observing telescopes. Okay. So a brief history, 1960s, that's a discovery. 70s and 80s were a period of a lot of papers written, proposing a, a future satellite, Asian satellite. In the 90s, we had the first major PRB mission off from Gamma Ray Observatory. The experiment I mentioned showed that we could get about one GRB per day all sky related these things. And then things started picking up with more satellites in the late 90s. We had uh, what was called the first afterglow of the gamma ray burst. So I'll talk about this in a second. The afterglow, essentially the thing that allowed us to figure out how distant the gamma ray burst. With that came the realization that these things are cosmologically distant. So this is Basically, start of my grad school era, I was involved in a satellite called Eddy 2 I was in graduate school. So this was a fun time for me. We all had beepers, free cell phone days. The gamma ray burst goes off, get the beep, you wake up, you drop whatever you're doing, and you go handle your data, make sure all these guys on the ground get the message, do their work. Eddy 2 found first direct connection of the gamma ray burst to the supernova. You know the gamma ray bursts have to do with the deaths of massive stars. It also found the first afterglow of a short duration gamma ray burst, which we talked about shortly, having to do with an association between gamma ray bursts and gravitational waves. Nowadays, and for the last uh, 15 plus years or so, we've had a satellite called SWIFT, which has really opened up this whole field. Although in the last few years, it's kind of trailed off, we're getting fewer and fewer detections. And I'll talk about uh, future missions for the end. Okay, so just let's give a kind of big picture, like science 101 intro to what these things are. This is kind of your cartoon of the evolution of a massive star. So let's say a star that has at least uh, 10 solar masses of material, maybe 50, maybe 100. It uh, lives a very short life. As it 
burns through material in its core and builds up this kind of onion skin like structure. For down in the middle, you have burning to iron. You have successively lighter metals all the way to hydrogen, outer envelope. And, and the sun and our star. This all happens quite fast. The star might live, you know, 10 million years. Eventually, it burns through all this material. There's nothing to support it in terms of its gravitational desire to collapse. So the outer layers kind of come screaming into the core. Uh, that produces a sort of bounce. That's how you get a core collapse supernova. And this is getting a little cartoonish at this point, but this is how we see the GRB coming to be. Somehow in that process, as materials coming in, uh, the core is squeezed into a compact object like a neutron star or a black hole. It forms an accretion disk around that compact object. Somehow in that process, there's an emission of very highly energetic gamma rays cones either pull that object. So this is the gamma ray burst, this emission that happens in some kind of late phase of this evolution. So sort of that's that's kind of an intro to what a gamma ray burst is. Let me say a little more about the physics here. So in this this field, we talk about the progenitor. This could be the uh, massive star, right? In the case of uh, most of the gamma ray bursts we'll talk about, we speak of a central engine. That's the source of energy, which is uh, typically going to be a neutron star or a black hole, a very compact source, which we're going to tap for gravitational energy uh, via accretion onto the disk around that object. Somehow there's this outflow of uh, material in these jets, right? a little bit of a complicated process. And then if you think about what happens to that material as it goes outward, we get what's called the gamma ray bursts from internal shocks of this material. So think of pulses of gamma ray light that are moving out at different velocities catch up to one another and self-direct. That produces very highly time variable structures, at least gamma ray burst. And then eventually that material keeps on going out and it starts to sweep up in the interstellar medium, heats it up, shocks it up, and it gives you a very broad band, so-called afterglow. That's the emission, which starts out highly relativistic, the Lorentz factors of 100 to 1,000, so very close to the speed of light. Energies that are uh, comparable to the rest of the sun, very energetic stuff coming out. It sweeps into the external medium. That kinetic energy of the blast wave is then used uh, effectively by the external medium as it slows down to modest the lens factor. And then that emission can kind of post and it can last for uh, hours to weeks for the brightest events of the year. Okay, so that's what a GRB is. So that's the GRB right there. This is the so-called afterglow. We observe from the radio, X-rays, optical, and gamma ray bands, whereas this is mostly just him. <clears throat> okay, let me introduce a science topic now. As I said, I want to do two science topics. The first one I want to go over is the role of GRBs for cosmology studies. I want to highlight two that are sort of driving what we're doing the community. The overall picture here is a uh, GRB is the brightest explosion we know of in the universe. They're very fast. You can observe a GRB and then point a large telescope with a spectrograph at that position. You can use the GRB kind of like the lighthouse in this picture. Kind of put a little gray in the foreground to give you a sense of the way the lighthouse, the light from the lighthouse has to go through all the, the water vapor and other stuff there. Or reaches us. So one of the main ways we use GRBs for cosmology studies is to use them as backlights through the universe. We're essentially trying to study the way the light was absorbed in that very bright source. Because it's so bright, we can detect one of these things at a very great distance, perhaps uh, corresponding to the first generation of the star. Okay? That's kind of the, the fun part. Technically, what we're doing is we're we're getting data, spectroscopic data. We're looking at absorption, understand the gas and the dust in the galaxies, most galaxies of the GRBs themselves. Once we understand that, what we're really trying to do is study studying the, the damping wave of Lyman alpha 
at the host galaxy. Because if we can look at that, that's going to give us the ionization history, how much hydrogen is ionized and neutral as a function of the distance. So it's going to allow us to study the ionization history of the group. Here's a popular cartoon for thinking about how that came. So here's early universe, hydrogen is neutral, that's the hot big bang. Here's nowadays, the universe is largely ionized. Right? We look out into the universe, it's nice, open, transparent. If you trace that back in time, there was a process whereby the universe, after it uh, was initially very ionized and it became you know, neutral, there's a time when uh, the first stars, the first galaxies, the first bubbles, very sort of random and splotchy process. And as that process happens, the so-called reionization, we go from the early universe to modern. The interest in studying reionization is to understand how this happens, what you associate it with stars, galaxies, whether it's, uh, you know, what it's like spatially, and then as a function of time, on this axis, how the universe is going, reionizing, becoming the present. The spectrum, because it's a wavelength at a specific uh, distance, the location of known lines in that spectrum will give you redshift, which then translates to time. The spectrum essentially allows you to map out along one line of sight. Let's say this is a gamma ray burst. That light had to travel along this line of sight to reach us out here. So it gives us a pencil beam through this whole process. That's the game with PRBs and high redshift. The problem though, is that these are very rare. We might get one of these events a year. We have to be very good at following them up, trying to get big telescope time. Yep. Yeah, I can do that. I'll also try to make it louder if it's a little better. Uh, Okay, whoa, that's loud. Yep. Yeah, tell me if it's too loud and I'll uh, hold it away a little bit. Okay, so that was uh, key science topic one, high redshift universe cosmology and gamma ray bursts. Let me go on to the second science topic. Um, oh, wait here. There we go is the connection between gamma ray bursts and gravitational waves. This is a, a more recent topic. I'll give you a little bit of background on this. The overall idea though, is you have two compact objects shown in the picture here. This could be a neutron star and a neutron star, and neutron star and a black hole, or perhaps two black holes. Due to the effects of uh, general relativity, a close binary like this eventually uh, gets closer and eventually merges as a result of shedding light or energy via uh, gravitational waves. The energy is lost, the system, unlike the, the uh, classical case, doesn't remain stable, it eventually shrinks, the two objects merge. Okay. And so kind of what's happening is you can think of these two objects distorting space-time. That distortion gets uh, more significant as these get closer to each other. Eventually, they merge into a single object. This signal I'll show you in a second. It's kind of like a chirp of the sound. Okay. Now, before I do that, though, let me just talk about the connection of gamma ray bursts. So, for quite a long time, we've known there are two types of gamma ray bursts so called short duration gamma ray bursts and so called long duration gamma ray bursts. They're not cleanly separated in terms of the duration, which is along this axis, but they're sort of two bumps, right? And there's been a suspicion for a long time that these, which have time scales of order milliseconds, seconds, are due to very compact objects based on light travel time measurements, whereas these are due to larger things like stars. Okay? And in the 2000s, we established this quite clearly for the long duration bursts. Essentially, every long duration burst we look at when we get a host galaxy, we see that it's in the tightest knot of star formation in that galaxy clear indication that these are due to, you know, bright young stars. And then for a few, which are very nearby, we can actually observe them time scale of about a week or so. We can actually see a supernova spectrum merging out of the data. The direct connection in a few cases between a GRB and a supernova. 
we know that there's a connection between these long duration bursts and core collapse. Okay. Now, this one has been more challenging. So how do we prove that these are due to mergers? Okay, there's uh, indirect evidence. Like when we look at the host galaxies of these guys, they tend to be in older star forming regions, tend to be often outside of a galaxy. There's been a kit, something that might happen with like type 1a supernovae, they have to do with uh, compact objects. Um, and then as of 2017, we have a direct connection via the gravitational wave signal that was produced and at the same time observed as a gamma. That's the clearest uh, direct evidence. Okay, but that's the second science case. This is an uh, example of a gravitational wave signal. Let me stop talking for a second. Two detectors, shows the signal. You can hear it first at a, the original frequency, then it'll play at a sort of a higher frequency. So you can hear it a little bit. Notice how the sound is low frequency and then goes to higher frequency. So called chirp. That's due to the merger of the objects. See the time history is here. I'm still in the past, so let me just uh, review where we've gotten from these kind of detections in recent years. Um, as of 2017, around the time that first event was found that linked to a, uh, a gamma ray burst, this was a merger of two neutron stars in uh, August of 2017, 17th of August. Um, at that point, there'd been you know, roughly a handful of events, the first two LIGO runs. And then a third LIGO run happened that was cut short by COVID. We got about a half of the LIGO run. In total, there have been about two years of solid observation so far. And we have examples of about two neutron star and neutron star mergers, two neutron star black hole mergers. And interestingly, in that last little LIGO run, they got really good at these uh, black hole black holes. A lot of those. The next LIGO run is coming up this spring. One of the things we're doing is kind of bring that. Okay, let's just talk about this signal a little bit. So this was the, the really important event I mentioned uh, back in 2017. So this is a little cartoon of what's happening. We have two compact objects merging, sort of shows how the signal is going as those things are getting closer together and eventually they merge. And then you get this ring down structure at the very end. So this was the signal very much matches theory from numerical relativity, with the signal that's uh, kind of predicted in terms of its shape. What was really important about this event is we got very rapid follow-up and we found a new optical source right there, uh, very close to a well-known galaxy. Okay. So I was involved in some of the follow-up. This was some X-ray data that we helped take. We also saw the source of the X-rays. And then this in turn became very hush hush. We weren't allowed to talk about it. Eventually became Nobel Prize in Physics that year. But it, it was really a, a pretty amazing discovery to finally make the connection between the gravitational waves and the gamma ray burst and stuff. Okay, and these fine folks getting the Nobel Prize. And eventually, once that happened, we were all happy and we could go out and discuss them. So, Folks have maybe seen these pictures before, just to say LIGO is a pretty amazing thing. I'm not going to go into the details, but I find it really amazing that this was sort of sketched out in a little class, MIT in the 60s. How would you go about detecting gravitation waves? Amazing. What you eventually, they eventually decided to do was to have these uh, you know, kilometer, two kilometer long uh, laser beams, very high powered lasers at right angles. The gravitational wave goes through, it shrinks one of these beams and extends the other. 
And so by looking at uh, interference patterns, you can measure very tiny variations which is what you need to detect these kind of signals that would go from space that pass right through the Earth. Otherwise, you can kind of see here where some of these observatories, we have more now. These observatories, when you get more of them, they allow you to get more directional information about where the signals are. Okay. So uh, this was actually the first detection back in 2015. Uh, you've seen me now show a few slides like this. This kind of characteristic signal, right? You bring down the top of the end. Um, we're always, you know, matching these to theory to try to make sure they're real. The way of plotting it in the function of frequency to show the chirp. And for the first couple of years, the way this game went, we would detect something, we would make an argument based on how unlikely it was that a truck driving by would use the signal, right? So you have sort of a indirect measurement of this thing being real, you have an idea that, okay, this, this would happen very rarely, modeled based on, in this case, uh, very heavy black holes, right? But for we astronomers, the big issue was how do you go about proving this is real, okay? And moving beyond this idea that it's justified, it's rare, or it matches theory, what you wanted to do was uh, match this up to astronomy, right? actually find a source, optical or infrared, observable light that corresponded to this action, right? This is, this, is, this is me, that's not enough for me, at least for most other scientists like me. We want to see the electromagnetic signal. That's what astronomy has been historically, so we want to be able to connect up gravitational wave science to electromagnetic science. Okay? And so we do that, right? We can connect up to our existing knowledge of things like black holes and neutron stars, how they come out of the, the death of massive stars. Up all this. How do you do it? Well, you have to do a very difficult game of using ground based telescopes, point and crawl over very large regions of the sky where this mission could have come from, find your new source, right? to find that kind of new needle in the haystack that was the source that corresponded to that gravitation. And those regions are huge least a few hundred square degrees in a lot of cases. And they look pretty wild too. So this is a map of the sky projected on Earth. And you can see that the air regions shown in blue, these large swaths that can cover a very large part of the sky. Right? And a typical large telescope might be able to look at something the size of the moon. A smaller telescope or survey telescopes might be able to look over a few degrees. But to survey hundreds of square degrees, you have to basically start doing a new kind of survey astronomy. This required uh, telescopes that really do wide field surveys to pull this off. To back up, there's basically two ways of doing this. Uh, strategy one is your large telescope strategy. This is actually the way it was solved the first time, 2017 event. So you just look at bright galaxies. You know the gravitational waves are nearby. Most of the galaxies, perhaps all of them, you know. You just point to nearby galaxies, take pictures of those, and look at things around that galaxy. That's one strategy. So that's the way it works. But it's not viable for the bulk of gamma ray, or sorry, gravitational wave detection to really spread out the sky. The other strategy is you want to target not just the bright galaxies, which give you 50% odds, right? So it could be in a galaxy, it could be outside of a galaxy. You want to target everything. It's going to involve typically smaller telescopes and a lot less sensitivity. Smaller telescopes, not, not as much light gathering potential, but a smaller telescope could observe degrees at a time. So by using small telescopes, survey telescopes, you could in principle try to cover these entire. Okay, so this is sort of where we were prior to LIGO, during this period, observers around the world are pursuing both of these strategies kinds of possible. And in context, this is what the event of 2017 looked like. It was luckily quite bright. So it was, it was uh, contained, the air region was contained, in this very narrow region. So it was possible to uh, know there's only a handful of galaxies that are in that region. And you could point at those basically in the course of the ballot. Uh, that's how the source is found. So that was how the afterglow, one call it that, gravitational. 
this plot shows the association with the gamma ray burst. It's also there. So at the bottom is the gravitational wave signal. Notice the time axis, right? It's lasting seconds. Zero is the time of merger. And then two satellites, Fermi and Integral, also found a short spike in gamma rays at approximately the same time. Okay. Don't fret about whether it's exactly zero. It's actually closer to two seconds. You don't have to fret about whether one comes first or the other. It's a very messy physical process. Just the fact of finding a source a million light years away and the signals and gravitational waves and light only 1.7 seconds apart provides basically the best measurement of the speed of light. Okay. So it's basically saying the speed of light and the speed of gravity, gravitational wave propagation, are the same to a part. So just this 1.7 seconds is pretty, the fact that it's that close. Okay, so this happened once, right? This happened in 2017. Nice, you can see it's like the best case, right? Real nice tight gravitational wave error region. Nice gamma ray burst immediately following it. And the big question at that point was, is this going to happen every month? Are we now in a game where we can start doing this kind of science regularly? Or is this a one-off very weak? I want to point out a couple more things before I go on. So this is a picture of the optical I showed earlier, the x-rays. Uh, we, we found a fading new source and all those bands. And an important point about the x-ray observations is that the x-ray light started out quite faint and actually picked up and increased in intensity. So that was an indication that this was a sort of weird gamma ray burst. It wasn't a classical gamma ray burst in the sense that not jet pointed directly at us. It was more likely a jet that was uh, pointed a little bit away from us, say like a jet had like a 15 degree angle and we're like 15 degrees from the center. So as that material reached the external medium, and slowed down, we could observe more of the jet through the relative beaming effects. And that's why it increased in intensity. But it's, in a sense, not a classical gamma ray burst. It wasn't a jet pointed directly at us. This, this, is, like an, this is an important point. OK, so that's my two science cases. I want to move on to the uh, present. There we go, present. And uh, kind of big picture of what I want to do is talk about how we've been using this new window, this gravitational wave, GRB kind of combined window at ASU in combination with uh, small robotic telescopes and larger ground-based telescopes to do some of the science. I want to touch base briefly on a couple of the robotic telescopes. I'll focus on Rattier and Dotty. I want to focus on Rattier because it's an experiment that's just now wrapping up after 10 years. We'll sort of celebrate it for a second and then put them into context of how we actually do this kind of research. Okay, first off, this is Rattier. The rat tier uh, is shown here in this uh, telescope dome. It stands for the reionization and transient infrared camera. From the name, reionization, you can probably get a sense that we're using this to chase very distant gamma ray bursts. Okay. Um, this is a collaboration between the US and Mexico. Started in 2012, just ended the summer, so 10 years. In that time, we got about 76 papers, eight PhD theses, we them at ASU. We observed something like 350 gamma. Quite an active experiment. It was on the telescope, 100% of the dedicated experiment. This is the way I did it science. So we would capture six simultaneous images from the infrared. This is a H band, J band, Y band, and for the optical, we have an R band, I band, T band. And what we're looking for is the signature of attenuation by the intergalactic medium. The intergalactic medium, the burst is far away will totally annihilate the blue light, but it'll let the red light pass. And based on which camera we get our first lack of detection, we can drive a photo redshift, which gives us the redshift estimate in sense of distance. So this is an example of a redshift uh, six gamma ray burst back in 2013. This is the new source. And then you can see in the R-band image, which would be the most sensitive camera, it's gone. So that's a direct measurement of the source of redshift six. What Rattier is trying to do is to make that measurement within minutes, maybe an hour, 
but the source is still bright and we can point at Gemini, big telescope. It's kind of the front line, identify a very high redshift gamma ray burst. Um, this shows you where we are. This is a little dome that Rattier was on, the light pollution map. Look at that, it's kind of fun. This is the mountain that Rattier is on, San Pedro Mokir. There's uh, us in that big blob right there of light pollution. One of our other favorite observatories in Arizona, darker. Uh, this place at San Pedro is one of the best sites for optical infrared astronomy on the planet. Very nice, dry, high desert site. Very good place to be. Um, this telescope uh, is on loan to the Mexicans from U of A for a dollar per year. Like really nice, old, old fashioned telescope that worked quite well for us. Here's a picture of us back in, I think, 2009 when we were surveying the site. We, Josh Berkeley, Xavier Pachaska at Santa Cruz, William Lee from Panama in Mexico, who's going to be the director. And Jesus Gonzalez, who is our optical designer, and now the current director of the Cabiche, who's the head of the observatory down there. This is actually a national park. You just drive there up to the top. You go to observe, you can drive in the large. Pretty cool place. It's a lot of fun to visit. The whole project is just tons of fun. Go up there, beautiful site. Uh, this was on a uh, sort of moon that night. Look to the north and see uh, Cali, Arizona. Nights. If you look in any other direction, it's totally black. Um, you can see the colors in the Milky Way just with your naked eye. It's pretty awesome. It's pretty neat to be able to go to the mountain and do that. And it also gave me, as a very junior person, a chance to build an instrument. This is the instrument we built which was done in collaboration with NASA and uh, a few other institutes. And we use, uh, we'll talk much about the instrument, we use uh, infrared detectors and optical detectors, these uh, magical pieces of glass called dichroics, that the light up separately. Something we continue to do. So this instrument got built, luckily it came together and it worked for 10 years. Now it's uh, back in the States, wrap this whole project up. Um, another thing I learned how to do and uh, folks in my group, group learned how to do is how to write software for these kind of robotic telescopes. So these things, these telescopes have to be able to respond to gamma ray bursts without any human involvement, to be able to go all the way from observations to the science automatically. And so we learned how to do very fast data analysis where we could point to a field and actually generate our scientific result on the fly so that someone could wake up in the middle of the night, log in, paste that, and we had to go pretty much all the way from observations to science, very automated fashion. And since then, we've done this for rats here. We've uh, done pipelines for two additional robotic telescopes. And there's kind of another generation of telescopes we trying to do this. Okay, so let me go to the future. Talk about what's coming up. Then we try to touch back into these uh, two science cases. So first off, let me uh, talk a little bit about preparation for the next LIGO run. And here I want to plug uh, a bit of Selena Petrova's work on predicting what we might see in the next LIGO run. Okay, what these plots show are observations of short duration gamma ray bursts detected by the SWIFT satellite over the last few years. And what we're trying to do in this analysis, assume that all those short bursts came from merger events. Know the rate of merger events now from LIGO, roughly. And so, given uh, statements about uh, distributions of uh, stars, massive stars, how long it takes them to merge after their explosions, given a luminosity function model, and given, most importantly, some kind of notion of how the jet angle, we can go ahead and predict from the models of the orange curve, make them match the observed data we would attach. So once we have that, then we can make predictions of model extrapolated to different parts of the uh, universe. Okay? So we want to predict the joint distribution of a GRB and a gravity. What are the odds we see? Biggest uncertainty here is jetting. Remember I showed you all these pictures where you have like a beam coming out of the GRB, it's narrow. Uh, if that beam isn't pointed at you, you generally don't see the GRB. GRBs have narrow jets all the time, a whole lot more out there than the demographics are very different. The expected rate is very different. 
This is sort of the state of play of actually observed opening angles for DRB jets. Uh, most of these are arrows, right? That means not measured, that means a limit, or maybe a handful that are actually measured, peaking maybe uh, five degrees, 10 degrees, but then this whole loud tail opening angles that can be quite large. So what we try to do in modeling this is understand how this can arise from observational effects. And so it turns out that, that beaming fraction, this is the fraction of the circle or the sky that a jet pokes through, tends to be, this is the inverse beaming fraction, tends to be very distant to the edge. So this is because a, a burst that's very narrow uh, for a given luminosity will be able to channel more of its energy directly at it. It's much larger. So by the time you get to high redshift, great distance, you only end up detecting the bursts that are like a pencil beam pointed to the edge. So that means you're only detecting one in a thousand. Flip side of that is if you go to the nearby universe, you can detect almost all of them. So you're detecting and you're much more sensitive to any of those jets around you here at large open. This is another way of saying the same thing. This gives the distribution of opening angles uh, for different distance sets. So if you took the observed distribution, you might have something like the blue curve here. Then if you looked at just the observed distribution for the ones greater than the one about here, they would tend to be much more narrow, very narrow. So this is sort of an argument that this effect, whether the peak here at five degrees, is mainly an observation bias, because those of the events are detected. And to get more events, greater distance. Volume. <clears throat> okay, so let me go on to our prediction. So based on the models, we can make these kind of predictions. And what we're trying to do is uh, figure out how many events the left dotted curve. So this is the so-called LIGO volume. This is the volume of the universe out to a distance about 200 megaparsecs of LIGO can detect star. star. And so what we try to do is map the GRB sample which you can see isn't even measured to much greater distance. We don't have any GRBs aside from the one case map. We have to extrapolate all the way back into this region. And then there are two curves with air region. This one, which is all gamma ray bursts with respect to the beaming. And then this more yellowish one are the ones that are being very active. So this says that at about this distance, we expect about 0.2, the big uncertainty, gamma ray burst gravitational events per year that are pointed directly at you. And of order, say one, might not be. Right? So the big question, depending on what you're actually going to see if you've got an observer, you're going to get this, this part, or you're going to get this part, is whether or not you can detect a gamma ray burst that's not pointed directly. Which in fact, was the case first that affected the point. So it's kind of, it kind of gives you a sense as well of how difficult this game is. Even best case, for detecting maybe one event of you. We need LIGO, or a more sensitive version of LIGO, to each upgraded uh, operating system for all that. Um, so that's where we are. We have a prediction for the next cycle, which will begin in the spring. Uh, what we're trying to do is get all these robots up and running. So we're trying to basically hotwire this mountain on San Pedro at different products. And we want them to be able to respond to these error regions, optimize schedules to do the best work. Example, the smallest end of the that could degree optical transit imager, six 11 inch telescopes, which is a little camera on the front, up on this big pedestal. Those telescopes point at separate parts of the sky and they can simultaneously image uh, 72 square degrees. Remember I told you those LIGO regions were 200 square degrees? This kind of experiment could follow an entire LIGO air region uh, pretty short enough. Actually, go and study the entire night sky in a uh, fairly deep region. So this is like our front line, uh, find something new and find something fast. Awesome. These are two of the cameras. You can see how the field of view of one of those cameras compares to the full moon. This is a pretty big field of view on the sky. We have six of those cameras, and typically we tile, so we might have 100 or so points in the sides. 
what we got to be able to do in software is study each of those images. Each of those images might have 100,000 stars in it. You have to correctly identify each of those 100,000 stars and find the one new source in that image. Do that 100 times. So you had to be very good at this game, be very fast. Obviously, the, there's no time for a human to do this. And in this case, uh, I ask if you can see the little red circle at the top. That was the one new source detected in this image, flag. Turns out that was an asteroid. We realized that in an image of this size, you can see one or two asteroids every time you take it. You actually have to have a good catalog, catalogs of the source. Um, in terms of the GRB missions, the next big thing coming online after SWIFT is called SWAM, or the uh, Space-Based Multiband Astronomical Variable Objects Monitor. This is a fairly traditional gamma ray burst satellite, the ones I used back in my grad school days. It's got a gamma ray burst detector, just high energies, it's got an X-ray telescope, it's got a gamma ray imager. And the no novel thing about this satellite, it's a French Chinese uh, collaboration that has a dedicated network of ground-based telescopes. Something NASA has never really used for previous So the Chinese are building two types of systems. The French are building a type of system. We're directly involved in here at ASU. We're developing software that ground-based system, much like we did for that. So FOM's main science is going to be the high register network of telescopes is also getting really good at gravitation. This is what one of the dedicated uh, telescopes looks like. This is a uh, Colibri Lindbergh down in San Pedro Martir, Alan Watson, our uh, kind of telescope guru. It's now working and maintains them, builds instruments and all sorts of stuff. It's a 1.3 meter telescope. Back here was 1.5 meter telescope. It's similar in size much more modern, stable, faster. And it will have a similar complement of instruments to Rattier. Uh, this is basically Rattier's replacement for It has the same optical and infrared detector. French Rubin designing their own infrared detector. And it will also have a spectrograph. And, it will be a and our role in this, we have dedicated time, is doing the pipeline. And the pipeline has to be able to identify these high reach bomb be very fast. Okay. So that's it. Let me wrap up just with a, a final looking forward slide. Um, the kind of astronomy that's starting that's coming out of these experiments is very new. So it's, uh, it's a field of these uh, transit surveys, it's sort of monitoring the night sky, mining it for new things, not just in the optics. But in multi messenger sets, application waves, neutrinos, also. Um, LIGO is coming back online, so that'll be picking up in the spring. Big question is can we get another of these exciting sources to make it routine? It's uh, based on our analysis uh, possible, but challenging. It really requires the telescopes to be dedicated to search for reliable. Next generation GRB missions are coming along the next year. SPOM will be launching. It will be always pointing anti sun. It will give a lot of GRBs. Okay, so that likewise has its dedicated ground based follow up. And then I just wanted to highlight the Rubin Observatory, previously LSST, which will be uh, monitoring the entire night sky, looking for new sources, predicted to find something like 100,000 new sources. It's a whole like uh, sort of game change reality where these ground based telescopes have to follow up. Sources try to get some context. Right? Big telescope on the ground. Small. Okay, but it's a whole fun regime of GRBs, all these kind of novel transits that we talk about, light and gravitational waves. And I think it just opens up a whole kind of new way of doing astrophysics. We're looking for sources, robots called a lot of data mining, a lot of process, and uh, trying to go from that path to something. Okay, so I hope that gives you a good sense of where GRBs have been, where they're headed, what are some of the big questions. Um, yeah, open up the questions.
Thank you so much. That was super interesting. Um, any questions from the room? Or we can also look at, um, do you have access to the questions or? Okay. Um, questions from the room? Hi. Hello. Thank you. Hello, thank you for your talk. Uh, you briefly mentioned a more sophisticated version of LIGO that would ha help with detection of DRBs. Are you thinking of anything in particular? Or... Yeah, so it's interesting. So LIGO can go to more sensitivity, which is clearly something that happened in that third one, we started getting into more, more events. If that sensitivity can be pushed to get us on that 200 megaparsec, it was anywhere close to the megaparsec. Increases in sensitivity are really important. Um, LIGO is also thinking about uh, the so, space targeting very deep black hole. Black, black. So that uh, is a different direction whether LIGO actually impacts this field differently. But I think we're most likely to see similar sensitivity. My, my hope is. Other questions? I have a few questions of my own. So while others are thinking, maybe I can ask the question. Um, so um, you showed that difference of about one point some seconds between the two. Although, um, I mean, we probably there are a lot of different physics, but and one of the things we know that the jet was not pointing towards us. Could something with that, like some kind of a reflection, or I, mean, I don't even know the right terms to ask the question, but um, could the fact that it's not pointing towards us be the main source of the offset, or is it something with to do with the physics that where the light is generated versus where the yeah. gravitational wave is? You, you can put so much into the physics that initially I think we were thinking of searching for the derivatives of the gravitational because you have this very nasty process. Labs, more manipulation, whatever it's supposed to happen. There's a lot of complicated physics that travel, explosion happens, explosion last. Um, you do have time, uh, time histories of GRBs are quite complicated because they're really facts. You get uh, non trivial. So I think it's just amazing the fact that here. And it may be why it could be more difficult in the future. It's a lot harder to find that here on the verbal place. Yes, the physics are, physics is a gravitational way of simple and thick zero. And even the gamma ray emission is like 10 to the minus three all in out. Gravity, GRB is. Thank you. Uh, questions uh, online? Okay. Yep. Okay, so the first one is uh, not sure if they missed it, but what type of detectors are used in telescopes for gamma rays? So, gamma ray telescopes in space? Perhaps the question. So, what kind of tele? What kind of, uh, for example, what type of de what type of detectors are used in telescopes for gamma? Let's let's take this maybe as an example. So, uh, gamma ray detectors like the GRM, you and and in the hard X rays, you have things like uh, like scintillators and sodium iodide crystals, things that can basically take a gamma ray and convert it into uh, photons you can measure. Those uh, tend not to be imaging devices. Things like eclairs, these imaging devices typically work by a coated mask on the top. It creates a shadow pattern depending on where the gamma ray burst is. And you read it out on a solid state detector, like cadmium zinc telluride, something that can process uh, hard X rays and things to give you an isolated image. Those are the kind of materials. Uh, these things tend not to be, you know, like you have to do a coated mask, it's really hard to image. Yeah. The X-ray telescope 
can image x-rays in uh, very shallow instances very easily to build an x-ray telescope. Uh, somewhat more analogous to a visual telescope. You have mirrors of some sort to focus light. We have one more online here. How are the locations for ground-based interferometers, such mm -hmm. as LIGO, determined, or selected? So how do they get to some of those banana-shaped regions? It's basically triangulation. You can think of it that way. So you have a signal that comes in in some time that crosses the Earth at a few points. You can kind of triangulate where in the sky that was. Um, so you, you sort of a time and a location through you sort of back project it to the sky and it's going to be used for the air region. No more questions online. Okay. Um, any last questions from the, from the room? If not, let's thank Professor Butler once again. Thank you. Yeah. And thank Thanks to our online audience and in-person audience for being here. Have a good evening.